department has to pick up. Yeah, that's right. Slack. That's right. Because uh, sometimes all these horror stories come back to the department. Exactly. Yeah. They don't want to get a bad name for leaving people hanging. Exactly. Yeah. Glad to talk more about that. Off on. Uh, okay, so um, for the latter hour of uh, uh, for the latter hour of, of today's session, I wanted to talk about uh, about dealing with, with what I call data gradients, uh, situations where uh, we don't have always uh, have provided to us sufficient data to parameterize a model parameters entirely. But we may have data which we can leverage in other areas. And there's uh, two, two basic processes, one called backing out and one called calibration, by which we can turn data from one area and use it, take data from another area and use it to estimate our model parameters um, uh, in ways that, that might not be immediately obvious. So what we're talking about here is the model calibration phase of the overall modeling process I defined at the beginning of the class. And um, the sources of data will depend on, on your area of application. In my area, in the, in the health area, um, there's a wide variety of sources um, of, of possible uh, data that we might use for parameter estimates. Um, we've talked about sensitivity analysis. The key point I want to um, focus on today is um, Often we'll have certain parameters in our model that are not well known, where we don't have data that in isolation can allow us to estimate the value of, of that parameter. The perverse thing here is that, uh, well, no data may specifically give us a good value for that for a particular parameter. <coughs> we don't have data about the overall behavior of the system, the behavior of the system as a whole that doesn't relate to one parameter in isolation, but rather to a combination of influences. It's emergent. It's, it's a result of interactions of several components of the model that may be complex enough type of emergence, we can't go directly back from it to figure out what the value of the parameter might, might be. But in some sense, it constrains our interpretation of what those parameters might be. It, it, it provides constraints. It provides patterns which we need to, the model to stay true to. Um, so, you know, some parameters may not be directly observable, but there may be closely related observable data that relates to emergent properties in that area of the model that's, that is available. Um, uh, sometimes we may have data that's at an aggregate level, it's not broken down in the way uh, that the model is, but it may, for example, specify the sum of a bunch of stocks and flows if we were to have a uh, <coughs> stock and flow model, or the sum of a bunch of, um, of uh, across uh, groups within a population, groups with different characteristics or what have you. Um, so some parameters, uh, uh, well, so in order to go back from this sort of data to um, to parameter estimates, we can engage in what's called backing out process and a calibration. And I'm going to briefly touch on backing out. I think it's a process which some of you will have encountered before. Um, and then we'll talk about calibration where I want to spend most of my time. So you recall the, the issue here is that often we have a model that we're simultaneously seeking to match a variety of sources of data. We may have data about different pieces of the system over time and we're seeking to match the data across uh, different areas, sub-areas of the model to that data um, uh, and, and make it true to all, as true as possible to all of those um, pieces of data that we have. So the first process is backing out. And basically, it's a manual process of taking several pieces of data, often aggregate, and then using them collectively to figure out what the most, more detailed data must be. And frequently, this process involves imposing some assumptions, sometimes quite strong assumptions or, or, or stringent assumptions uh, in the process. So um, we may be, for example, within the process combining data from, from different data sources. We may make use of equilibrium assumptions or independence of factors. So it's often fairly strong assumptions we bring to bear in the backing up process. And we have to be very cautious about that. 
So the example I had here, suppose we wanted to find the sex-specific prevalence, so the, the, the fraction of the population for each sex separately that has diabetes. And suppose we don't know what that is, but what we do know is uh, the breakdown of the whole population by sex, so what fraction of male, what fraction of female. We know the whole prevalence for the whole population, the, the entire population. <coughs> Um, so we may know, you know, 60 uh, or you know, 26 percent is is uh, is diabetic in the population as a whole, and we might know the rate ratio. In other words, um, the 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 uh, what the fractional prevalence is for women divided by fractional prevalence for men, because we have a statement of that in the literature. If we have these pieces, we can logically back out the sex-specific prevalence from this. Um, and here we can do it without imposing extra assumptions. If all of these this data are from the same population, it's a matter of, of simple algebra. Um, so we know the number of male diabetics, so it's the number of female diabetics, it's the total number of diabetics, and we know the so-called rate ratio. This is prevalent, so this might be you know, uh, 10% and 5% or more you know, than 5 and 10%. Um, for example, and by using simple algebra here, we can solve for, and I'll let you folks you know, look through this if, if you are interested, by systematically substituting in these factoids, we can end up solving for a piece of M and a piece of M. Um, we are simply using the facts at our disposal, the total prevalence, the number of people who are male, the number of people who are female, and we're trying to find piece of M, piece of F, and we can simply solve for it. This is a, an example of what's called backing out. And quite frequently, you get in a situation where a little bit of backing out can get you the information you need. You don't have exactly what you're looking for from the literature, but you have enough pieces you can figure out what it must be. Disadvantages of this is that frequently involves questionable assumptions and uh, Sometimes, even though we know a lot of information, it'll be extremely complex to try to back out because it involves so many pieces tangled together. And yeah. Are we also constrained by using the exact same population? Yes. So, for exactly. example, exactly. I have nationwide data, but I'm doing precisely. I'm in the city, so I, I have a little bit of a difference. Exactly. So, this is what I was, um, I was saying often involves combining data from different contexts. And you, you sometimes get, you know, rather shaky assumptions that, okay, we'll assume the citywide prevalence is the same as the right. statewide prevalence or the countrywide or, or what have you, which, um, you know, uh, might get you to a very, very rough estimate. There may be pretty big error bars around it. Um, so, uh, you know, frequently we end up imposing uh, pretty significant assumptions. So, and, and another example here that I, I don't have time to go into, but you could follow. Uh, if we had something like um, the count of people in each sex and geographic category, then marginal prevalence. Um, so the prevalence for rural individuals, for urban, for male, and for female. And we want to figure out like what's the prevalence among rural males, prevalence among rural females, et cetera. We could try to do that, um, but we need to impose additional assumptions here. Um, so uh, we need, we might need to, for example, assume this is similar to what what you were saying that you know uh, we know that suppose we said okay we're we're going to assume the ratio of prevalence among uh, rural and between rural and urban among males is the same as, as the, that corresponding ratio for the whole population um, in prevalence. Now, if we make that assumption, we could then solve for what these might be in an algebraic way. But we've imposed this extra assumption. And it carries baggage, it carries uncertainty with it. So this sort of backing out is very common in my experience in modeling. People will, will have a bunch of data and they'll try to get rough estimates for certain parameters given that data and given some extra assumptions. But it is, um, it is fraught with more and more assumptions as you have more and more tenuous data or, or, or less and less dense data, data that's more sparse. 
So an alternative methodology that we'll be talking about today is something known as calibration. And this is more general um, in, its, in what it can handle. It can handle a variety of, of um, data on different pieces of a model and still try to give you a picture of what parameter values must be. And basically it's a process of making use of the constraints that are um, implicit in data you do have, observed data, to, to constrain what interpretations are of parameter values. So in essence, we tune the values of less well-known parameters within a model to best match observed data, simultaneously seeking to match data across multiple different areas of the model. So we may be ma matching many time series or many pieces of data at the same time. And essentially, we're trying to get the software here, rather than algebra, to answer the questions, what must less well-known parameters be in order to explain simultaneously all these different sources of data I do have? Because often, ladies and gentlemen, we have data that's about the system behavior as a whole, rather than about, or, or large pieces of the system, rather than about one particular parameter. And we can leverage that data using calibration. And that's what I call data gradient. We may not have data on the parameters in isolation, but we may have data on many different sub-pieces of the model, perhaps even over time, and we can use that to good effect through calibration. So like backing out, it's starting data that is almost what we want, or, or that has some elements, and use it to, to figure out what the missing values might be. Okay, um, here, the observed data needn't be very, have very, very straightforward relationship. It can be emergent properties that are have em exhibit emergence that's very complex. It doesn't need to be this sort of straightforward relationship we see here, or straightforward relationship we see here. It can be quite, quite complicated. And one of the most important aspects of this, and this has occurred many times to me as a model, is that it's it, often we learn from this process that there's something wrong. Sometimes we learn that our model just doesn't cut it. It, it, it. There's no simultaneous way it can explain this data. And we have to go back and re-examine the model. Sometimes we learn that the data is problematic. Yeah? Or what if, what if you've got a case where you're using, you've developed your model based on existing theory. Yeah. So the body of knowledge says this. That's right. I built my model based on the body of knowledge. Yeah. That's yes. right. So is that enough to begin to start trying to poke holes in the theory, or is that something where you just kind of, your model just isn't mm -hmm. high enough fidelity, or what, what's kind of... No, that's, so in as much as a model encodes a sort of working hypothesis about how things, the way things right. work out there in the world, the way things are functioning, um, it, it, modeling is sometimes talked about as theory building. The, the act of modeling is operational theory building. We're, 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 we're characterizing this theory and we're seeing the logical consequences of that. Consequences that aren't immediately apparent when we just muse about it in our mind, right? And um, that is exactly what I'm referring to, that we may have built this model in, in good faith based on reasonable interpretations of what's known. It just doesn't jive and then we need to start broadening our understanding and saying, okay, what could we have missed? Now, often there's two classes of things, okay? Um, one thing is we may have missed an important salient feature of the world that we haven't captured, like we've ignored some effect, assumed that it's, it's, um, it's just simply ignored in the model um, altogether, and we need to re-examine that, that scope. And, and then through structural sensitivity analyses, often you know, change the model structure and see if, if that might plausibly account for a lot of the variation. Another thing we will do is uh, sometimes uh, challenge our aggregation assumptions or assumptions about sort of details which are perhaps somewhat represent the model but, but not at the level that they might need to be, okay? But a third thing that, that often is required is we need to scrutinize that data because data doesn't come from heaven. You know, it, it come, it, it's uh, often 
often carries its own burdens. And a couple times as a modeler, I have been, um, uh, I've been um, sort of surprised because the model just wasn't driving. I thought there was something wrong with the model, but it turns out it, it helped spot a problem in the data. And when I went to the appropriate parties, they said, oh, that year, the definition of what was included in the data source changed. From that year forward, it's a different definition. Um, or for that period of years where it just didn't add up, it was different. And that too is useful, right? Because it allows you to clean the data or at least downplay the significance of those discrepancies for that period of time because you understand where it's coming from, or at least plausibly. But broadly speaking, um, I have found that it's at this point that I often iterate back within this process, modeling process, I iterate back the model formulation. And sometimes even to sort of scoping the model and figure out, okay, what's, what's in there, what should not be. So this is important. This is not an issue of a problem per se. It's, this is part of the discovery of modeling. And it's, um, it's something which is bittersweet in the sense that you, know, you have some perhaps plan for how the model is to proceed. And this may sometimes disrupt your plans, your timeline, your schedule. On the same time, you've learned something you wouldn't have learned except for modeling. You've learned that this theory that you had articulated just isn't driving with the data, either due to problems with data or theory. And often, you get to the root of it. And you've discovered something. You've learned something. And that ultimately is one of the big purposes of modeling. So you could say it's a it's a barrier, you could say it's a shortcoming of the model, but it's, it reflects one of the advantages of the modeling process. And the fact that you can't, you know, it, it gives me great solace as a modeler, I'll get to you Chris uh, in just a sec, it gives me great solace as a modeler to know that, you know, modeling is not some loosey-goosey affair where you can just match any model to any data and, and you know, declare it done and, and walk away, declare success. I mean, if it were, there wouldn't be a lot of gains from it, and there'd be a lot of reason for s severe skepticism. The fact that we are so often, you know, tripped up at calibration and have to go back and re-examine our assumptions is actually a good thing about modeling. It's something that keeps us honest, so to speak, right? So I think it's, that gives me solace. Yeah, Chris. I was just thinking, it comes back to the uh, beginning of the class about models for prediction versus yeah. models for insight. Yeah. That's right. Um, that's it's an interesting observation because um, uh, you know a fair bit of what we're talking about here is geared towards sort of models for prediction, where you have a, a sort of quantitative model. There's there's also a, a tremendous amount of learning that goes in you know during these earlier phases of kind of making sense of what you, what you see and, and putting together the components of it. Um, when you have a sort of a, a model that's more qualitative and used more for, for insight, it isn't trying to kind of uh, capture the, the variability and, and uh, you know, many, many elements of the world. You're, you're not going to be able to to um, undertake this process in quite as much, um, with quite as much anticipation that you know your uh, your underlying understanding of how the world works is off. I think um, it's very interesting. I'm going to have to to think more about that, um, about how that applies in, in that context. So um, this this characterizes some of some of the discussion there. Fundamentally, it does help us falsify models. Helps us falsify models. Uh, particularly those and aimed at, at uh, predictions. So what we're going to be talking about here in the calibration is use of a global optimization algorithm to adjust unknown parameters so that the model matches an arbitrarily large set of data. And we'll see how any logic allows us to do this. Uh, the data often 
not always in the form of monosuits, it can be point estimates, um, often forms a set of constraints on the calibration. We're, we're trying to, um, I, should be, I should use that term advisedly though, it, it's a constraint on sort of what model uh, values the parameters are appropriate. It, it helps impose the objective function for the calibration. And the optimization algorithm here often runs a model many thousands or more of time to find the best match for the data. Now, if time allows in this class, I'm going to talk about an alternative approach to this, uh, to calibration. This is sort of classic calibration. And by the way, it goes by different names in different sub-areas of modeling. Sometimes it's simply called parameter estimation. There's an alternative approach um, that's starting to emerge based on uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which um, puts aside the goal of trying to arrive at a best estimate of the parameters. And instead, it gives you a posterior distribution for the parameters. In other words, a distribution, uh, an estimate of a probability distribution for those parameter values instead of forcing you to have one particular best guess at the parameter values. If I can, I'll try to give a lecture on that before the end of, of the semester. Um, so in order to, to undertake this calibration, there's uh, several pieces that are needed. And this is true regardless of whether we're working in Venison with stock and flow models or in any logic with, uh, with the uh, optimization functionality it provides. So we need to specify something about what we're trying to match, what empirical data, uh, and what we're matching it to, what parameters to vary, over what ranges to vary them, and any characteristics of the desired optimization whether you have a starting point of the search, how do you know when you've gone far enough, et cetera. Um, so we're going to be talking about parameter space here, a space where we may have, say, three parameters uh, that whose values are not well known. And a given point in the space corresponds to a particular assumption about mu, a particular assumption about beta, a particular assumption about top. Right? Um, so we're trying to identify kind of the best, best uh, guess within this parameter space that, that gives the best match. Yeah, that's, that's the approach we're, we're going to be talking about today. Trying to explore this parameter space to find the best fit, the sweet spot where the model exhibits the best fit to the observed data. Now, um, in order to one of the components is, is, is articulating a standard of goodness of fit. How do you know how good the fit is? Um, and within the model, um, often what we'll do is for each historical datum, data <coughs> point, we'll calculate a discrepancy of the model from that for a particular run of the model and or a particular set of assumptions with the model, which may involve many realizations. And, and then we'll sum up these discrepancies, where these discrepancies are measured in fractional values. Um, now, it turns out that, and I don't have time to go into this in too much detail. Um, it may be that we'll have to break till, um, uh, keep some of this till next time. But it turns out that when we measure discrepancy with respect to a datum, there are certain characteristics of that discrepancy measurement that are desirable. Um, and I'll list several of them here. This, this is, is non-trivial. I mean, you don't want to just use any discrepancy measurement um, at all. So first of all, you want something that's dimensionless. By dimensionless, I mean that um, it's, uh, it's not measured in terms of people or dollars or time. And the reason is, generally, you want to arrive at a single number for the discrepancy, for a particular set of parameter values. For a particular point within this space, you want to be able to say the discrepancy, the average discrepancy, say, is x. Okay? And, uh, and uh, in order to do that, you may have to add up discrepancies across dollars and across people. In order to add those together, they have to be dimensionless. So you, you won't be adding dollars to people. Yeah, the ball. So is that for the people around the model? Okay. So generally speaking, and, and the, some slides will be getting into this and we'll look at how it's done, you're going to need so 
So let's let's step back for a second. Within within a stock and flow model, a classic system dynamics, deterministic. If you run the model on with a particular assumption for beta, particular assumption for mu, particular assumption for tau, and you run the model, you will get a deterministic result, right? And you can match that deterministic result against historic data using some discrepancy metric, um, um, some squared error or what have you. Um, I would argue that even there you want something with dimensionless, etc. But you can match it and there's no use running it again because every time it's going to be exactly the same thing, right? For a stochastic model, you don't have that luxury. and. Um, uh, I think I comment on that. Um, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's a later slide yet. Um, you don't have that luxury. So to be clear, within within uh, in, in any logic model, whether it's a discrete event model where you have uncertainty in how long a procedure will take, whether it's a, um, a an agent-based model, um, you're going to have some stochastics in the dynamics that are observed for a particular mu, a particular beta, and a particular tau. Who gets infected first? Um, uh, you know, is it the person with a lot of connections or few connections? Um, how quickly does that person recover? All, all these things are uncertainties. And so what I'm saying is that for a given point in the space, if we were to just run it one time to that point in space, we might get a really good match to the historic data, but that might be a fluke, right? It might be a fluke because of the vagaries of chance um, for that run. And so generally speaking, when it comes to the models we're looking at here, for each point in the space, you're going to have to run the model a number of times. And well, you are going to be exploring this space. Um, and find the set of parameters who, when you run the model quite a few times with that set of parameters, you find the best match to that historic data, that historic data collectively. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the particulars of the discrepancy, but uh, um, very, very similar to that. Okay. Um, so it adds texture, though, because like it, within Benson calibration, you'd be wandering over the space trying to find the best value for beta, mu, and tau that will give you the best match. And you're just running it one time for each one, for each, uh, each of those. Here, you might be running it 10 times for each point in the space and taking the average of the discrepancies for that, something along those lines. Um, Okay, so um, I would argue that the discrepancy metric uh, should be dimensionless because it needs to be able to combine together discrepancies in dollars with discrepancies of people, discrepancies in incidence rate with discrepancies in prevalence rate. Um, and you want to be able to, to add together these quantities. Um, it should be weighted. So we might have some data which is of higher quality than other data, better pedigree of data. And we might be able to, might want to weight it more highly. For example, we might have one estimate of the prevalence of an infection in the population that's sampled over, you know, 100,000 people sampled for it, and another that was just a sample of 100 people. And we don't want to treat those as being equal when we try to match them. Um, analytic, uh, I, I won't go into here, but. I would argue that you don't want to rob Peter to pay Paul here. You don't want to, so to speak, um, uh, have, have, have one thing be matched super, super well at the cost of all the others. Um, generally speaking, two small discrepancies of size, say, uh, alpha should be considered more desirable rather than having one dis discrepancy of size, two alpha and no discrepancy for the others. You, you sort of want, want to sort of um, avoid having big discrepancies um, in, in concentrating those discrepancies all in one thing. You kind of uh, have, have a lot of small discrepancies, perhaps, instead. You want 
want it to be symmetric, so being off by a factor of two should have the same weight, for example, whether we're two times the value or one half the value, non-negative. So no discrepancy, a uh, discrepancy one thing shouldn't cancel out a discrepancy in another. Uh, more discrepancy should be worse, not, not better. Um, and um, and finite, uh, uh, finite input should yield finite discrepancies. Now, there should be not inf infinite discrepancies. Um, uh, so there's a set of criteria there in terms of discrepancies. And this is one discrepancy function that, that matches them pretty well. So you have some historic data minus a model estimate, and you can divide by the average of the two. Now this works if um, H and M are guaranteed to be greater than or equal to zero, so they're, they're not negative. Um, and then you square it. And um, so if you have a particular, particular estimate, you want to match the model to, Model estimate, take the historic minus the model. Because it's squared, it doesn't matter which is minus which. And then over the average of them. And um, and you'll notice that the denominator is only zero, and the numerator is zero, as long as H and M are both greater than or equal to zero. So um, uh, it actually matches uh, quite well. In that case, you could treat it as, as zero. And it's concave because you have the square there. The square also means it's non-negative. You never get a discrepancy that sort of cancels out another one. So this is a discrepancy function that we've worked with quite a bit. Um, uh, for weighting, uh, I noted sort of the desire to weight it. Um, uh, you may want to give greater weight for greater accuracy of the sort of data. Um, sometimes you care more about things because it's more core to the purpose of the model. Um, and if there's simply no data available for certain time periods, for example, the weight should be zero for, for the uh, corresponding um, discrepancies. So we're going to be looking here at a global optimization algorithm. It starts at a random position and tries to improve the map by adjusting parameters, running the model, recording an error function. And it keeps on improving until it reaches a local minimum in terms of fit, okay? Um, and uh, it turns out that there's more sophisticated global optimization algorithms. Uh, if you look at the NLOpt library, for example, nonlinear optimization, um, uh, that's, that's a useful uh, point of reference. And I believe it contains a number of quite sophisticated algorithms. Uh, so I'd like to open up a model called SIR agent-based calibration. And we've seen this before for a different purpose. And we're going to be looking today specifically at the calibration component rather than at the component we looked at before, which was focused around um, sensitivity analysis. So let's open up SIR agent-based calibration. Not SIR agent-based, but SIR agent-based calibration. It's a sample model and uh, provided by AnyLogic. So uh, you'll go AnyLogic uh, example models, and uh, it should be, uh, should be in those listed, uh, listed there. So um, uh, it's right there. Now, I already have it loaded, so uh, I don't think it's going to make a, make a difference here for me. OK, so um, no. So let's take a look at SAR agent calibration. Before you'll recall, we were looking at this Monte Carlo 2D histogram. Remember that? Okay, today we're going to be focusing, today and likely tomorrow or, or Friday, we're going to be focusing on this calibration. Okay. Um, first of all, let's run it. Let's, let's just see what's going on and we'll work to understand how it's doing what it's doing. Okay. It's actually rather involved. It, it relates to something talked about in the sensitivity analysis lecture, Duval's question, for example, with respect to um, uh, multiple replications or realizations and how that's realized. Okay, so we've just called this up, and you'll notice incidentally, and we'll come to try to explain this, you notice when I ran that, I didn't get my normal screen where I just press the button and it goes on. Instead, this is like the experiment screen, right? Remember, we saw this kind of the experiment, and then you click that button, and that other, remember we saw that button actually calls to open main. Here we have everything kind of the experiment screen, and we can experiment uh, window, 
and we can do run calibration. You'll notice it's trying different fits to the yellow, which is the historic data here. So there's some yellow data, and it's running this model with different parameter values, trying to find the best possible match to the yellow while adjusting those parameters. You notice it's trying um, okay, many, many different iterations, and for each one, it's trying a contact rate and an infection probability. You'll notice over time, it's getting closer and closer to that yellow. Okay, let me, let me uh, stop that um, ju to just start again here. Um, excuse me, it's actually retained the latest one there, so I'm gonna actually restart the whole darn thing. So here we go. So we'll say run. And here's the historic datum, the yellow. We're gonna run it. And it is, uh, it, it's gonna take a little bit and then, okay, so it's trying, this red represents its best match thus far. Um, and it is uh, is trying to uh, trying to match it, and it's optimizing its guesses as to these. This is its best guess so far. This is the objective function with its best guess. You notice the so-called objective function got better and better and better, and then it sort of plateaued for a while. Then it got modestly better as it's getting closer and closer. And you can see the reds actually got very close to the yellow there. It's getting very, very close indeed. Um, so, you know, it's improving over time in sort of its cumulative best guess as to what this is. Now, um, if we go and we um, were to stop this here, I'm gonna stop. You notice it's 3.827 and 0 0.149, okay? Um, by the way, these were different particular guesses that it tried but this red was the best that found thus far. So you notice it wasn't uniformly getting better. Perhaps as a general rule, it was sort of slowly improving, but there were still estimates all over the map. Okay, so 3.827 and 0 0.149. Now, if we go and we go into, excuse me, it's, it's in calibration. If we double click on calibration here, um, You'll notice there's a window up above. We're gonna see how, how this works down below. But if you scroll up, you'll notice it says um, the historic data are actually from contact rate 1.5 and infection probability 0 0.4. Um, and you'll see actually it's still quite, quite far from that actually. Um, so it actually achieved a pretty good get, a pretty good match without being without getting that exact, um, exact value. Presumably, if you allowed it to explore over time, it would um, eventually get closer and closer. But it kind of makes you wonder here, and I haven't sat down and thought about it, whether there might be multiple parameters that yield equally good matches, um, it, which is sometimes possible. Um, okay, so um, we've taken, uh, taken a look at sort of how this works. What's going on behind the scenes? That is what we're going to examine. Uh, we're gonna probably talk about 10 minutes now and then we'll continue on, on Friday. Okay, um, so I'm gonna give you sort of a high level tour of this right now. Um, but again, we're matching a system that starts at a random position, tries to improve the match by minimizing the error by adjusting parameters and it keeps on improving until it reaches some local minimum. Let's take a high level look at some of the pieces involved in this and then we'll come back to it next time. So first I'd like you to go to calibration here and go look at the properties of the calibration, okay? Um, so if you click on calibration and you go look at the general properties, you'll notice some features. Some may remind you a little bit of the, the sensitivity exercise we executed thus far. Okay, you'll see a number of relevant factors here. Um, the first is down at the bottom, you'll notice that there's a definition of various parameters. And what's different about the middle two? Can anyone tell me? Those middle two are different than the top and the bottom. What's different about them? Okay, they're over a range and they are varying. They're, they're continuous rather than fixed. So they're very continuously over this range. And uh, 
leaving unspecified now is exactly how they're being chosen over that range. But those are the ones that are being varied for that parameter space. So folks, when we talked about this, um, this space, mu and beta might be here, contact rate, well, infection probability and contact, excuse me, beta would be infection probability, contact rate, well, yeah, sure, you could call it maybe mu. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, so um, new, uh, and you could do experiment, oop, oop, sorry, new, new experiment, um, and then optimization. You, you'll notice that it has this little uh, attractor uh, symbol, you know, and, and there you go. Okay, so that's one element, which parameters you vary, right? Another element is what's the objective function? And you'll notice that that's specified up here, this objective, it says, and it says minimize difference, okay? Turns out this difference is built into any logic, but you can use your own. You don't have to, you don't have to use its. It's just that it provides that for convenience. Uh, this is some squared error um, between the two, okay? Um, but you'll notice this is only doing it for a single data set. In other words, Maybe, maybe you have data on the numbers of deaths and the numbers of infectious people, in which case you might need to do, you know, difference of that plus difference of another one. Um, or you just define your own function and, and have it compute. You'll notice another thing here is iteration count. How many runs does it do before it stops, right? And finally, there's random seed up here, which specifies the initial seed to use, okay? That is iterations, each of which may include many replications. So let's go, let's go to, to, to talk about that. Let's go to replications. If you click on the replications area, you'll notice that it says basically replications per iteration, okay? So in other words, each of those 500 iterations could have a certain number of replications. Let's talk about the, why you would do that. Well. Oops. Um, do, 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 do. Here, when we talk about an iteration, we're talking about a particular point in the space. Mm -hmm. And for each such point, you might want to run several realizations because of what? Because it's stochastic. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because there's uncertainty in the results just due to those stochastics, and you don't want to be stuck in a situation where you rate that point badly because the, of a fluke that it matched badly because of stochastics is a one out of 100 thing. You want to run the model red many times there to get a representative sense, so to speak, of how good it is at that space. Five yes. Yeah. <laughs> five is a pretty impoverished number. I think they wanted something to be updating very obviously in front of you. Um, and by the way, I think that could be one of the reasons why it's yielding a not so good estimate there. Um, because it's, you know, imagine you only ran this one time and there's a fair degree of variability to the stochastics. You might be pushed away from a space for no good reason, right? Yeah. So, <coughs> so how do we guard against overfitting our model? Sorry? Yeah. So, so these are good questions. Um, so the, the, the concern about overfitting here is, uh, might be about, okay, are you going to end up with parameters that are really representative or, uh, and you're generalizable, right? right? Or are you going to be matching just to the, to the vagaries of, 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 of the particular data you happen to have uh, observed and, and matching all its peculiarities in a way that isn't really generalizable at all. Um, part of the answer to that, it seems to me, lies in running many replications. Because if you only win one replication, you might, you know, just because this particular chance history had that same weird dog leg in it, you know, you're going to be 
rating it highly, right? Um, rather than trying to assess kind of the, the variability associated with those parameter values. Um, but another answer is the discrepancy function um, has got to, uh, you know, it, a, a, a good discrepancy function should, should still let you get some considerable um, a rate quite, quite highly a match, which doesn't match all the bends and so on, but, but captures the central tendency, captures sort of the, the fact you, you have the, 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 the trend well captured. So there may be some variability around it, but it, but it has a good is sort of match overall. I don't know that I have a great answer to that. Let me think about that some more, but I think both of those things uh, speak, uh, are, are relevant to that issue of, of overfitting, yeah. Well, so I know in like a regression analysis, when you're worried about overfitting, there's different methods like bootstrap methods. So if you take a sample from your sample, right. and you estimate that on from that sample, and you evaluate it on the remainder, and yeah. do it again and again and again. And so I, I don't think there'd be a straightforward way of doing that with this, but if you had multiple data sources, you could estimate the parameters on yeah. four, and then evaluate it on the fifth, and do that for all of them. Or, and then evaluate them on three, and uh, uh, estimate it based on three, and evaluate right. it on two. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and see, and the discrepancy between the two, um, between the, the, the fit indices that you get on the original and the train, the train data set and the validation data set give you some sense of the overall fit. And you can kind of correct for that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And w it, that goes by the name uh, cross validation in, in these models. And um, I, th I think that that would be a sort of a deeper way to address it. I, I, I'm grateful for. Chris for, for bringing that up. Um, um, so so th that, I'm not sure that that's what you have in mind, like specifically with respect to calibration, but it seems to me in as much as you, calibration is one of the main ways you make use of that data, right? I mean, you'd also have to be conscious of it for parameterization because you wouldn't, you'd want to in some sense have blinded your model to that all through the phases of building it, you know, in, in parameterization and see if you could replicate it outside of, of that. But I mean, generally speaking, in, in, uh, in the calibration process, I'm not sure that I would say it's, um, it's overfitting um, is, is a foremost risk uh, per se there. But I'll see if I could think about it more and get you a more complete answer. Because I, I think you ask an interesting question. Now, Duvall's question was a bit different. Um, as I understood it, that has to do with sort of over or under determined systems. So is it possible, for example, you may have many different combinations of parameters that yield equally good or similar fits? It could be the ratio between the two. It, it, exactly. And yeah. we see that all the time in certain types of models. So for example, in, in, in classic infectious uh, mathematical epidemiology, you know, what r really matters is perhaps beta times C, for example. Um, so it's not one, like this is the only way this would occur, uh, perhaps in a, in a classic SIR model. Th this, these are the only way these two occur. They're just multiplied by each other. So you could, you could have high beta and low C, or, or you know, low beta and high C, and they yield equally good results. It's mathematically, it's going to be identical. And one way to deal with that is you collapse them down to a single vacancy term. Um, it's a single variable that's adjusted. Um, but you know what you can get is in these kind of valley type situations where you sort of uh, you imagine you know you have mountains on either side and and these are really bad fits. But once you get down here, you can kind of go along this long shallow valley, and all of them are pretty much equally good. We have tools that we've developed in my group to sort of identify these, these situations and do principal components analysis to find sort of the combinations of variables that are, that are relevant there. And it, it's like Chris was saying, you sort of the, there are these trade-offs. And I think you have to be savvy to that. This is more obvious in a math classical mathematical epi model, like based on differential equations, because you see this term, right? Whereas in an agent-based model, things may be interacting in non-obvious ways. You know, agent mobility on the one hand may 
may lead to some implicit contact rates that, that aren't immediately obvious. And then there's a transmittivity, which is on top of that. And the point is, you could have high one, low the other, and get similar results. And it wouldn't be, it, it's not apparent from the specification of the model. So um, I think in the Asian-based context, I'll be, I'll be frank, I think calibration in, for Asian-based models is a, uh, it's still very much um, an evolving art. And we're going to look at how any logic supports it, which um, I think offers many strengths, but I think the book is not yet written on it. And I think uh, if you talk with people, and I have, people do large-scale Asian-based simulations for pandemic planning in the US and so on, um, you know, they're kind of learning as they're doing too, as to sort of what makes a decent fit, how to deal with stochastics in principled ways. Um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give one example that came up with a, with a student of, of mine um, in a postdoc um, uh, after he was working with someone else. So there's this data, for example, meningitis variability, um, which you get historically. and. Um, uh, there's a question on, you know, uh, if you have a stochastic model, um, it's actually a little bit more more oscillatory than I'm, I'm making out. I think I, I think in not quite like this, but but maybe not quite that much, but but, but almost so. And um, you know, how do you how do you best match that? Um, you know, for example, do you try to find the model? Do you try to find the set of parameters who which yield the best matching realization to this data? Mm -hmm. Or do you try to, so the single realization that matches that best, um, as it were, the single possible world that yields the best match. So maybe there's some, some you know, set of parameters where you actually get something that's, that's remarkably close to that. Or do you select a set of parameters that on average have kind of the closest fit to this? That might actually yield different parameter estimates. And then that is yeah. further complicated because the real world data, there are yes. interactive effects that you may not have considered in the model. That's right. You simplified it, so that's right. Now you're yeah, and, and moreover, the real world data has measurement error and and reporting bias, and yeah, I mean, those are probably some of the things you're thinking about. It. So if they I mean, if there were regular curves, you'd be trying to get like the, the, the wave like the frequency yeah. rather than the actual waves or something like that. Yeah. That's that's right. Except they're irregular. Yeah, you can you can do. <laughs> it, 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 no, this is is yeah. true, and I mean, we've actually I've done things like that for you know childhood infection data. It's just um, you know if, if you wanted to see if you could capture an agent-based model, the optimization strategy. Let's put it put it this way. I had I had different recommendations for my former my my the former PhD student now postdoc than his, his advisor, who's a real expert in, in um, mathematical modeling. We had two different approaches to sort of optimize, um, how best to optimize this, and two different objective functions, as it were, over the space of how do you deal with the variability between different runs. You know, are you looking for the single best, or are you looking for the parameter value that yields, on average, the best fit, or something like that. And, and I, I don't get the sense that you know there's consensus on this at all in the field. I think um, any logic, fortunately, offers. This was something, by the way, it's, it's very awkward to do in Benson. Um, you can actually do stochastics in Benson, but to do this, it just doesn't support it well. Any logic does support things like this. You could define different functions um, uh, for for goodness of that uh, quite readily, and um, you could actually. Uh, Change it to, to to match um, to match different criteria more flexibly than you can in any in Benson anyway. So this is an interesting example. Uh, we will see that with with respect to um, the uh, interface provided by any logic, one of the key components is this separation of iteration from replication. So here in the replications area, we um, we can select use replications, and we can either select a fixed number of replications, five, you're absolutely right, being too little, or a varying number. 
Now, this fixed number, um, the, the larger it is, generally the more um, samples you're going to have for a given point in that parameter space, right? For a given point within this space, you're going to have more samples. So your, your reading of kind of the average goodness of fit, at least, is going to be more reliable. On the other hand, you can be doing more work. There's also this varying number of replications, which I'll be going through sort of for, for stopping criteria. Um, so uh, calibration, experiment, those are some of the key components. We're going to take a look at where um, different things are, are specified here. Um, we also have some of the, the classic, um, classic things we've seen in, in other models. Um, uh, particularly for the sensitivity, we'll see how, that, um, how this works sort of recording the best, the best match, et cetera. Uh, finally, we'll see how in the optimization, you can define what are called constraints and requirements, which specify constraints on the parameter values that are legal and on the resulting dynamics as to whether it's a legit, it should be regarded as kind of a legit run or not. For example, maybe some combinations of parameters um, are not obviously bad by looking at the parameter values, but they yield negative values for some of the quantities in the model, in which case you might want to toss that model run out because it's not a legitimate calibration run. And uh, this provides a, a way to do that. Um, so uh, you mean the optimization? Uh, that is a good question. Um, well, okay. So it, 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 suffice it to say this. I mean, um, I can't answer your question about how good is any logic um, per se. What I will say is that it's a, it's a hard problem that you're dealing with. And I've done similar optimizations with other packages um, non-stochastically with you know a lot of, a lot of parameters I'd say maybe two dozen parameters or something a lot of data to constrain them but it's very expensive and you know I, I find myself sometimes going for a day um, you know optimizing this here the load is higher for a couple reasons for one thing is there's just more moving parts in the model so it takes a longer time to run each realization and secondly, um, the, you have to run m these realizations, multiple realizations for each point in space. So it's a pretty heavyweight operation. Um, it is an operation which in principle could be parallelized. Um, so you could, have, you could have it start from different points within you know, the starting space on different machines and run in parallel and then uh, find the best across all those runs. Uh, but it's, it's pretty heavy weight. And, and one of the things that is an unquestionable constraint is that the, as the number of parameters go up, that you're very, go up, right. the, the, you get the curse of dimensionality. It goes from a 1D space where you're just searching a line to a 2D space where you're searching a, you know, a, a, a surface to a 3D space. And the, the, the volume to be searched goes up you know, geometrically, and so that's very expensive. That's a good question. Um, so I have not. So you could change the objective function, but I think what you're asking is, could you change like from the simplex algorithm to a hill climbing or something like that? Um, I have not seen a feature where you could do it. What I do know is that yes, but more than that, I think any logic is built. I think any logic's engine here is built atop the OptQuest library, and the OptQuest library, I believe, has functionality to do that, and I believe that extends beyond any logic, but. I can't speak here from experience, so you know I'd have to look into it. But uh, uh, I, I'll reserve comment on that until I can look into it more. But I think there's reason to be hopeful. Yeah. 
Okay, um, so we're, we're out of time for today. I'm going to continue on this uh, on uh, Friday and go into in detail sort of how the pieces of this fit together, okay, and how you can define your own objective function, et cetera. Okay, very good. Does any logic have anything similar? So I'm like running this in the in arena. Yeah. Like it's a process analyzer that comes with it. You basically create a spreadsheet of all the scenarios. Right. You could set your number of replications, then you could just vary all the parameters that you want to vary. Right. Right. And then, you know, and it spits out the results as it right. as it runs down, and you just right. wait. you yeah. hit go and you walk yeah. away for a few That's days right. and come back. That's right. You know. So, any logic. So it's a good question. Any logic does have not a built-in functionality there, but I have students who have done that. Program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, they they define the scenarios in a database table. It basically populates it automatically over time. More and more scenarios running for these different ones. If there were interest, I'd be glad to see if I could try to get some, you know, find some, uh, uh, identify the code to do that, sure. and I could share it. Because, you know, um. It, it's very useful because, yeah, I think he had this thing running for half a year or something like that, <laughs> or running, yeah. run, running scenarios. <laughs> you know, he was running, I, I can't remember, like 4,000 scenarios each a thousand times. Um, and uh, he was just exploring this policy space uh, <laughs> and, and varying parameters for the policy space, seeing how the policy space changed with different assumptions. And actually, it yielded really interesting results. and. Once you get down, you know, thousands, thousands of runs um, for each point in that space, you can start to talk with great statistical significance about some of the differences. And it, was, it was a useful exercise, uh, very useful. And, you know, uh, hopefully we should be getting a paper out this summer on it. This is a science fair student. For us. <laughs>